I'm Julie Ozan, and we're talking today about celebrity watching in the virtual world. Now, you know that the University of Melbourne is a big research school, and we spend a lot of our time doing research, and we think it helps you because it makes our teaching a little bit more exciting. Now, you might want to wonder, what are two marketing professors doing studying celebrity watching? Does that seem kind of what you'd expect? <laughs> well, the logic is really simple. Consumers love celebrities. And so if you're a brand manager and you can match a well-loved celebrity to your brand, the logic is that some of that love is going to be shared with the brand. And celebrity endorsements are big business. Uh, if you can find uh, an appropriate celebrity, like a, a star athlete to pair with an appropriate product, like a high performance shoe, then this can generate a lot of excitement for the consumers. They may search for information and ultimately they may buy your, your, your brand. Um, so consumers love celebrities, marketers love celebrities, but they've always been a little bit difficult to operate with because mm -hmm. sometimes your celebrities will do naughty things that you don't really want associated with your brand. And right now, at this moment in time, with the rise of social media, managing this relationship has become really difficult. It used to be that the brand manager would carefully uh, curate the relationship between the star and the consumer. But of course, everything's gotten upended, right? Because the stars can try to enhance their brand, right, by communicating directly with the consumers. And the consumers, right, can just sidestep the brand manager and forge their own relationship. And so that's what's intrigued us, is what's going on in this new virtual space in this popular uh, pastime. And so that little arrow right there, that's what we're interested in. What's this new relationship? Can it be managed? And, and uh, does it have benefits? Or perhaps are there some problems around it? Uh, OK, a little help here is, is, is anybody, does anybody do a little celebrity watching? Can anybody tell me who? who uh, this celebrity is? No? Any guesses? Come on, fess up. It is a Kardashian. Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, this is Kylie Jenner, right? And she is the most popular celebrity on Snapchat. And if your parents are sitting there thinking like, what? It's OK. <laughs> You're not the market for this. <laughs> um, and the interesting thing is you would, you would kind of think that what would be really driving the celebrity watching would be all the big A-name stars like Beyonce or, or, or Taylor Swift. But the interesting thing is as people get into celebrity watching, they're much more interested in the B and C uh, list stars. And, and that'll become apparent in just a minute. OK, so what do we do? Well, let me just pause for a second. I know some of you are interested in marketing. And if uh, the interesting thing about marketing is it's the one function in the business area that really engages with the consumer. We're in direct contact with the consumer, and it's a two-way relationship. We use promotion to communicate the firm's message and ads, for example. We also engage directly with the consumer when we're, 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 we're doing uh, selling. And really important, we are the function that goes out and does the market research. So in this study, we had to be a little bit clever because consumers don't always want, them to, uh, want to tell you their secrets. The first uh, technique we used, and this was to study um, the digital lives of millennials who 50% do celebrity watching, uh, we used a very traditional technique, interviews. Right? And that was helpful. We got some insights. But what we discovered is this is a group phenomenon. People love to celebrity watch with their friends. So we had to innovate. And instead, we did friendship interviews. And that was kind of neat because the phenomenon of celebrity watching actually emerged in the interview. You could see it going on. And then we also partnered with a marketing research firm to be able to follow the real behavior. So uh, our, our millennials downloaded an app, and in real time, we could track celebrity watching behavior. And that was, that was really fun. So people might be watching their, their, their favorite reality uh, television show and be 
uh, sending you texts in real time about how they were enjoying this activity. Now, unfortunately, my colleague, Mikhail, she had to kind of suffer in this project. She had to travel to New York, to London. Uh, yeah, some, I worked very hard on Somebody that. had to suffer to, to collect <laughs> this data. And what we want to talk to you about is, is, are these three stages we found. Uh, and that's going to be the rest of, of the, the talk, is what did we discover when we started stalking our, watching the watchers, right? And um, I'm going to start off with the first phase. This is probably, if any of you are willing to fess up to doing this, this is probably where you are, right? This is just a fun thing to do, right? You're almost like, it's like a museum curating an art collection. You gather little bits and pieces, right? You select them, you make sure that they're, uh, they're, they're real insights, you might use them to kind of fantasize or imagine, and then I'll explain the last step, stripping in just a second. Um, this is sort of, this is something somebody might do 10, 15, 20 minutes a day. As we move down the intensity, people may be spending two hours a day doing this. So a, a, a very big shift occurs as we move down. Um, what does this look like? Well, it's, it's catching little bits of virtual insights. A lot of these are, not surprisingly, around fashion and style, but what's really desired are insights into the intimate lives of these stars. Uh, also, a lot of these people doing this celebrity watching, they're professionals. They're, uh, I don't know what, what image you have as, as, as we're talking, but they have full-time jobs, and they're also looking for how did these reality stars become famous? How did they become so successful? So they're also gathering a little career. Um, uh, it's not enough just to find these bits and pieces. The key is that they're authentic. There's sort of an interesting relationship that goes on here. The fan agrees to follow. I'm going to follow. I'll be loyal. But in that trade now, you have to reveal. You have to let me into your life. And the more you let me in, the better and the more loyal I'll become. So they really want, I, I'm not sure about you, but I don't think I would want that picture of, uh, on the left being shown. They want, they want these uh, uh, stars candid, real, authentic. And then, what they use, this is just kind of a, it's like, this is like eating potato chips. You know you shouldn't be doing it, but it's so much fun, right? It's salty and, and, and tasty. And that's what they like to, it's fun to take a break from work and watch these, the Kardashians do their silly things, right? Uh, and then another part that's a, a, a sort of a little bit of a, it's fun to be mean, is the last step is that they strip from their collection any star that they find not worthy. So if in this curating you discover that somebody maybe is fake, they're kind of, uh, they're, they're not really presenting a true, uh, admirable uh, persona, you'll rip them from your, your uh, collection. And here we see, uh, I'll go ahead and let you read this. Here we see a real group interview. You can see the back and forth between these women where, oh, I used to fall Miranda, but she, oh. She's so dumb, right? It's got sort of that, it's fun to be, fun, a little fun to be mean, right? And then that whole Orlando Bloom thing, oh, I wouldn't actively follow her. Yeah, 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 you just move on. That's right, you replace them with somebody else, you move on. Okay, so when you think about your celebrity watching, and I know, you know, a lot of us do it, we know that um, around over 54% of um, young millennial women do celebrity watch, so we know it's happening. I also did do some initial interviews with guys, and I can tell you guys do this too. So um, we are doing it, but most of us stay in this initial um, kind of phase, which is about curating, kind of having fun, just pulling together little bits and pieces about celebrity lives. But some of us actually move forward into the next phase. And the real differentiating factor is that uh, there's something about this celebrity that is relatable. She feels like I have a, or it feels like I've got a connection with her. Parts of her life are just like mine. And this begins to, I mean, that's actually Taylor Swift, but it begins to help us to understand why celebrity watchers tend to get fascinated with the lives of not A-list celebrities. We're not talking about um, Princess Kate here. As, as much as our celebrity watchers love to watch her, she's so completely unrelatable to their lives. 
they actually love level C and kind of D and B level kind of celebrities because they are relatable. There's something about them that's reflective in their lives. It's kind of like mine. And we get drawn in to this um, performing stage. And so what the second phase is, and you can see that the celebrity watching is becoming a little bit more intensive now. Um, there's a little bit more going on. It's more than just kind of looking at pictures and having fun and sort of celebrity, you know, stripping celebrities and kind of pulling to them to pieces. It's actually about role playing. So in this little bit more intense phase, what we saw was the informants in our study um, or a number of informants in our study, role playing at being a celebrity, being part of a celebrity's life, doing what celebrities do. And it was about the look of the celebrity. So we see Taylor Swift here, and yes, going out and getting some of those items. They actually didn't have to be um, the real item. So it, you didn't have to get you know the $2,000 handbag. It was fine if it looked like that, but I'm getting the look. And so they've moved on now. So it's not just about virtually consuming celebrity, it's about actually consuming celebrity. So going out and getting the look. But it was more than just the look, it was also taking on and role playing and getting into the character of a celebrity coming guys through the attitude. So I'll give you an example. Um, one of our informants, um, I call her Ella, she was in the UK and she was in a corporate job and sometimes she has meetings that she is not feeling confident about. She knows that something's happening, you know, at work, she's going to have to present, I'm not feeling that confident. What does she do? She wakes up in the morning, she puts on, this is her words, I put on my Beyonce face and I go out and conquer the world. And so she's stepping into the celebrity attitude that's really giving her the confidence to go out and you know do what she has to do at work but the thing about this role playing in this phase is that it's temporary it's not forever these informants these celebrity um, watching women are absolutely in control and so what they're doing when they're role playing they're having a bit of fun or they're using their celebrity watching to you know get into the character and give them the confidence in a really useful way to them and once they're done with it it's one of those cinderella moments i put on the outfit i go to work i feel fantastic i feel like a star or i go out to the club you know i'm wearing the star outfit but i go home i take the shoes off and I'm back to me again. So I'm in control. There's no commitment here. It's very, very temporary. It is a Cinderella moment. I can be who I want to be. I can take on that character, but it's not forever. So how these, um, these celebrity watchers were doing this was to really support that role playing by getting into character. And how do I get into character? One way I get into character is by surrounding myself with the right props to feel like I really am the celebrity. So Amber tells us you dress like them to be like them. So as you can absolutely understand, you know, it's about going out and getting the pieces of articles of clothes, the handbags, the shoes. Now these are not necessarily the designer items that are being worn by Taylor Swift, but they look like them. And it's enough for me to put them on a prop and feel like I'm in character and I am actually the celebrity. But it's more than just fashion. It might be fitness routines, for example. Um, a number of our informants talked about uh, Kourtney Kardashians. Some of you might know who Kourtney Kardashian is. Um, talking about Kourtney Kardashian's fitness regime and really getting into that. And that's one of the props that makes them feel like a star when they're following her fitness regime or actually going out and buying um, you know, Re Rebecca Judd loves um, designer kind of homeware or whatever it might be. And what those props are about is collating those physical items together to set the stage. So thinking about, you know, kind of put yourself in the shoes of maybe an actor on the stage, really getting into character and, um, and uh, interacting with the pop props in a way that helps me take on that persona. So it might be setting up my home, it might be going out and putting on the right outfit and going out to the right clubs and bars. So it makes me feel like, you know, it, it may not be that this is the bar that the celebrity goes to, but it's kind of enough to make me feel like I could be in that character for tonight. And then the final one there, I put work practices, because this was actually a really important um, type of role-playing activity that a number of our informants talked about. 
So they talked about how, like putting on the Beyonce face, but more than that, going out and buying the right outfit so that when they put on the right shoes, the right outfit, they took the handbag, they could go to work and feel like that, hey, they had that celebrity attitude. Uh, Jen, obviously that's not her real name, but Jen was one of our informers who did this regularly. She was a real estate agent in New York. And when she had a big deal, she was meeting clients for a really big contract um, in real estate. She would go along, she would kind of put on the celebrity outfit and, and really have the confidence to get that deal signed. Now the thing about these um, celebrity watches was that they were in control, absolutely. This was a temporary Cinderella moment. So the, they did this in a number of ways. The first way that they main, con, maintained control was to cognitively, so in their mind, cognitively, constantly separate um, fantasy from reality. So I know that this is just a character. I'm just getting in character for a while. I'm just temporarily role playing, but I'm gonna separate out fantasy from reality. I'm not gonna go over the top. The second way was through making sure they had a really wide variety of celebrities that they were picking and choosing bits and pieces from. I'm not mucking around with these ones. <laughs> Can you try and turn them on? So it was about picking and choosing little pieces. Ah, so <laughs> little pieces from multiple celebrities. So as um, Monique said, you know, if I chose just one celebrity, I think I might become obsessed. But if I pick little pieces from lots of different celebrities, I can stay in control of my role playing. And then the final one was a feeling of shame. So um, a number of our celebrity watchers actually took their role playing a little bit too far for them. They felt a little bit uncomfortable with it. So for example, um, Monique had had a number of um, um, cosmetic procedures to try and make herself look like Kylie Jenner um, and then after the third procedure actually felt a sense of shame that I've gone too far with this. This is no longer fun, it's no longer temporary, it's not just getting in character, this is taking it too far. And then we had our third um, form of celebrity watches and so this is where um, these ladies ha were either unable or unwilling to go through those mechanisms of self-control. And so rather than just consuming material items that could be replicas, for example, they are looking for authentic consumption. And the difference between these celebrity watches and the others was that it's not a temporary role playing getting into character anymore. What it actually is is a whole transformation. This is not temporary for these watchers. This is who they want to be. And so the lure of the celebrity is so magnetic that it actually pulls them into the next phase because these ladies want to be her. So the final phase we call um, permanently kind of transforming or going through a metamorphosis because these celebrity watchers wanted to be the celebrity butterfly. They wanted to go through that process and actually become a celebrity themselves. So for example, we have Molly who talks about, you know, it feels a bit weird, but I really just, I want to soak up their celebrity um, star quality because I want to be like one of them. And unlike our last, performers who worked quite hard at times to separate fantasy from reality and remind themselves about what's real and what's not real. These ladies did the opposite. They actually worked really hard to merge fantasy with reality and make them one and the same. So for example, Molly talked about her um, uh, uh, celebrity she wanted to become at this stage was Rihanna. So she talked about how at times she feels that her um, identity and Rihanna's actually fuses at certain times and certain locations. So this particular um, phase of celebrity watching, it wasn't good enough to have a replica handbag. These celebrity watchers had to have the handbag. So it wasn't good enough to have one that looked like Victoria and Beckham's handbag. They had to have Victoria Beckham's handbag. And that might be a purchase of two to $3,000. And it spread across their whole life. It's not just about clothing. It's not just about shoes. It's also about lifestyle. It's about where I go. It's about what I do, how I spend my time, my fitness regime, etc., etc. 
And what are the mechanisms that our celebrity watchers did to really support this transformation? We call grandstanding. So it was go about going out and um, really visibly showing their peer group and their, you know, their friends, their family about you know, hey, look at me, you know, I'm a celebrity now. And so it was really about that getting that affirmation, public affirmation and public feedback to say, absolutely, you're doing really well in this transformation. So it was about things like living extravagantly, dropping brand names, being really conspicuous in what they were wearing um, and dropping, you know, kind of name dropping as well. You know, it's a sort of like, you know, I haven't met her, but I know this celebrity because she's a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend, which makes me close enough to be her friend. Uh, another way in which they supported their transformation was through sharing the stage. So these ladies were not willing just to set up a stage with props around them. They wanted to be in the same physical space as the celebrity, their celebrity muse. So they would um, orchestrate, for example, uh, occasions where they could ensure that they were in the right bar with the celebrity at the right time. They might just be able to rub off some of their celebrity status onto them. Uh, for example, one of our informants actually uh, did the research to find out the apartment building where her favourite celebrity was living to make sure she could get an apartment in the apartment building next door to give her more opportunities to meet her favourite celebrity on the street as they were out walking their dogs, etc. Uh, and then finally, um, I guess the, the mechanism of control that these ladies use, so rather than the kind of self-regulation and those mechanics that we talked about earlier, what these ladies were doing to try and control their um, transformation was actually using external um, markers. So they were what we call benchmarking. So rather than internally kind of self-regulating their um, celebrity transformation, they would look out to their favourite celebrity, the one that they were trying to be, and benchmark themselves against that celebrity because they would feel disappointed if they weren't seen as being an equal to that particular celebrity. And what we saw was with some of our informants was that um, when they looked out and they did that benchmarking, they felt incredibly conflicted. So while some of our informants actually felt that they were quite close to who they wanted to be um, and quite close in their transformation, um, other celebr uh, celebrity watchers such as Eliza felt very conflicted. So we see um, Eliza there saying, I always feel really weird, I'm so obsessed with them. You know, I kind of feel, you know, that's not kind of, I don't feel that comfortable with it. But on the other hand, well, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, it's just, it's not really my choice. It's something that happens now, but I can't control it. I'd like to control it, but I can't control it. And the only way that Eliza could deal with that conflict was to double her efforts towards, uh, you know, kind of authentic purchases, double her efforts towards um, grandstanding and so on and so forth and just try even harder because with Eliza she says oh we've seen listen I wanted to be real so I'm going to basically act like it is real I want to be that celebrity I'm going to continue to act like I am that celebrity and what we saw with informants like Eliza for example she talked about how she's actually spent more way more in the last two years on her purchases trying to be this celebrity than she has actually earned so there are negativities and there are issues coming forward in this final phase of celebrity watching. So as um, marketers we always like to know what are the implications. So we do research, that's absolutely fantastic, but there has to be implications coming out of it. Not only for from a research perspective but also from a social perspective. So when we look at the first phase of celebrity watching, it's just kind of fun, you know, people are escaping. That's nothing new. We've all done that. It just so happens to be um, in a social media world now. Um, people are getting kind of a lot of vicarious or virtual pleasure from doing that. The second phase vicarious um, is, is more a phase of vicarious learning. So we see this role playing, people are having fun with it, but sometimes it's actually really useful too. So it's about, you know, getting that confidence to sign the deal, to be the person perhaps that they want to be in the workplace and then going home, taking off the clothes and, and, and going back into reality. So we actually saw kind of a playfulness coming out and consumers being really in control of this um, second phase. But it's the third phase of the transformation and the becoming that we are seeing that perhaps celebrity watching isn't always positive. Thank you.